we sent a lot of our quarter inch audio from radio out because we had no clue what was on the radio. You know, the radio, as you saw the quarter inch, they had really thin spines. So people didn't write a lot of information on the thin spines. We had one quarter inch audio tape that said Freedom Summer. That's it. Just said Freedom Summer. No idea what it was. When we got the digitized file back, we played it back, and it turned out to be Howard Zinn uh, recording voter registration during Freedom Summer which was amazing. And then we have all kinds of other stories during that, that voter registration period in the 60s, in 64, I believe, in the South, which is just incredible stories. Um, so that was, the, that's the, that was the benefit of digitizing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the background of the American Archive and where we're hoping to go, and a little tiny bit of background on GBH. So the American Archive is a partnership with uh, WGBH and the Library of Congress, and who doesn't know who the Art Library of Congress is, right? Everyone knows who the Library of Congress is. But we're a collaboration with them, um, and we're really thrilled to be collab uh, partners with them on this project. Uh, the Library of Congress is managing the pr long-term preservation of the American Archive files, and WGBH is um, more managing the access part of it in the front end and outreach to the stations. And we feel like this partnership really does um, strengthen both of our strength, it speaks to both of our strengths, the Library of Congress with long-term preservation and WGBH with access and outreach to the broader public media community. Um, so who is WGBH? Um, well, we are the f one of the top uh, producers of public television and radio for the public media system. Um, we produce about 30% roughly of what goes on in primetime PBS. Here are some of our titles that you know, um, Nova, Frontline, American Experience, New Yankee Workshop. Um, so we have a long history. We've been on the air since 1951 with radio and 1955 with television. So we have a very deep archive of which you saw our vault. Um, we have kept as much as we can, um, mostly program masters and as much um, master original materials that have gone into our programming, dating back as far as we can. There was a fire in 1960 which uh, destroyed a lot of the earlier programming, but we've been slowly trying to uh, recuperate them from collections like the PBD Awards and various other stations that might have gotten copies of them when we were bicycling tapes around. Um, but we do manage um, all kinds of formats from film, two inch, one inch, three quarter inch, in fact, all of the formats that Rebecca was mentioning, we pretty much have except maybe wax cylinder, although if Leah was here, she might correct one. Um, but we, we have quite a few. We have about 750,000 items in the archive total, um, over 300,000 master level materials in the vault. Um, so a little bit of a history of GBH, um, and I think it reflects the history of a lot of the other public media stations, um, particularly the ones that are our host stations. I know uh, Wisconsin, for example, probably started in a similar way, um, and uh, WHUT, although they were more affiliated with the university, um, you'll see that a lot of the public media stations in their beginnings started at universities, um, and that's mostly because they were about educational programming. And GBH started off um, actually in the 1830s, we like to date ourselves back to the 1830s with a public um, a bequest from uh, John Lowell, who uh, bequeathed some money to the city of Boston to begin the Lowell Institute. Um, he wanted to fund free public lectures for the Boston citizenry. Uh, they used to happen at the Corner Bookstore. I don't know if you've done the Freedom Trail, but the Corner Bookstore is still there. Uh, he funded free public lectures in order to help educate the citizenry that wasn't necessarily going to higher ed. And then in the 1900s, um, uh, Ralph Lowell, I believe, president of Harvard, um, started thinking, well, gosh, you know, we ought to be broadcasting these things because radio now exists and we can have a much further reach than just having a public lecture and having people come to a public lecture. We can actually put them on the radio and the city of Boston can actually hear it in their homes. So they started something called the Lowell Institute of Broadcasting. Um, and shortly after that, and they were, they were trying to um, co-op commercial stations and find time on the various commercial stations around the city of Boston to find times to air lectures from the universities or air you know, educational programming. Um, and that got really tiresome because they were having to squeeze in between schedules here and there and they couldn't actually formulate a, a, a real schedule. So when the FCC started to offer uh, educational nonprofit licenses, they jumped on it and they, um, they, grabbed, they grabbed a license and they called it WGBH. That was our call letters because our very first transmitter is on the Great Blue Hill, which is out in the southern south of Boston, which you can, you, I don't think you can see it from here, but as you drive around Boston, you might be able to see it. So it's called Great Blue Hill, WGBH. 
Um, and so this first clip is one of our first ones. This one's actually a 20-year anniversary, but it nicely kind of sets up our first broadcast, if I can just play it really quickly. The Lowell Institute Cooperative Broadcasting Council was established in the fall of 1946 with seven member institutions. The Lowell Institute, Boston College, Boston University, Harvard University, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Northeastern University, and Tufts University. Since then, the council has grown, and seven more institutions have become members. The Boston Symphony Orchestra, Brandeis University, the Museum of Fine Arts, the Museum of Science, the New England Conservatory of Music, Simmons College, and Yale University. At first, the activities of the council were confined to preparing adult educational radio programs for broadcast by commercial stations in the Boston area. And on February 3, 1947, 20 years ago today, the Lowell Institute Cooperative Broadcasting Council inaugurated its first day of broadcasting. If you happen to be listening to radio station WHDH at 9.45 p.m. on February 3, 1947, you heard the distinguished poet and scholar I.A. Richards, now Professor Emeritus at Harvard, in the first program of a new series entitled Your Ideas and Where They Come From. Professor Richards subsequently recreated this program at the Bush Risinger Museum at a later date, and this recording itself escaped the disastrous fire which struck the WGBH studios in 1961. Stop it there. But as you can see, we had a very close collaboration with all the universities in the Boston area. So in a similar way, uh, we're, we, we are to this day very closely collaborated with them. There are members of our board of trustees. Um, still have seats on there, and they, the forum network actually was something that has furthered that tradition of um, broadcasting public lectures. Um, they now go into these universities and and tape uh, lectures and 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 lesson classes, and they broadcast them and put them on the web for the public to see. So they're sharing, continuing to share that with the public. Um, but we went, on the, we went on the air with our call letters in 1951, although 1947, I believe, is what they said when our first broadcast was on a commercial station, which was WHDH. Um, so we, even our first studios was on the campus of MIT at 84 Mass Ave in Cambridge. Um, and the early productions were for local audiences. They were reports of national events to the local audience. Um, our, our first, very first broadcast was the Boston Symphony Orchestra with the idea that we're bringing culture to the citizens of Boston through a very public means. Um, and there's, here's our first program, which is the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Um, so we, we, sh we continue to share local cultural uh, programming with the Boston we, um, audience. We tape Tanglewood, we tape the Boston Symphony Orchestra and the Pops, and we have a huge collection of tapes in there. I don't know if Leah showed you some of the huge two-inch tapes, which were the Boston Symphony. Symphony. Um, local news um, began with news reports, really people just reading the news into a mic. Um, these were two of our early uh, broadcasters, um, and, and it was continuing to reach the news throughout the local um, audience, and it was only as far as the transmitter could reach. It was, so it was very limited to just the local area. Um, as the news studios, we continued to broadcast lectures and symphonies, but they also began to cover national events for the local audiences. I have two clips here which show the vari variety of programming. Um, I don't think I'm going to play these, though. One was um, Phil Oakes talking about the long, hot summer in 1964, and I think another one was uh, the 11th and final report of a series of weekly news reports documenting the civil rights movement in the summer of 1964, and I believe those are both actually in the American Archive at this point, I think. Along here, though. Um, we started to collaborate in the 60s with a local, net, a loose network of other stations that were covering national events. In 1963, eight years before National Public Radio existed, uh, WGBH and a small collection of radio stations along the East Coast dubbed the Educational Radio Network teamed up to broadcast the full and uninterrupted coverage of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, there was 17 hours of the march that was covered by various stations throughout the day. Um, and as the, as the march unfolded, GBH was really the only one that recorded the live broadcasts, and we kept them in our archives. So we actually do have all 17 hours of that broadcast. That's now up on our website on Open Vault. Um, 
and it's it was it's really a fabulous resource. We um, actually have an academic scholar who was writing a book on the March in Washington come and go through all 17 hours and take meticulous notes, and he gave us back those notes um, as a listener guide for us, which we were then able to post. So now people can easily find where various speeches happened and various events happened during the March in Washington. Um, so what is the American Archive? Well. Um, maybe you know this, but um, the American Archive is a collaboration between the GBH and the Library of Congress, and we're, we're, our goal is to preserve and make as accessible as possible uh, the radio and TV materials created by or for public TV and public radio in the United States dating back to the 40s. The library is responsible, again, for the long-term preservation of the digital files, and WGBH is responsible for the access and outreach to the stations and to content creators, um, although we've been working very collaboratively in everything. Our vision is to coordinate a national effort to preserve and make accessible these historic materials before they're lost. Um, our mission and goals are challenging. Uh, in addition to preserving, we want to assure discoverability and access. We want to guide and support current content creators and stewards of the material with best practices uh, to protect the historic programming. We want to facilitate the use of the materials and increase public awareness of its importance. And of course, we want to be able to sustain these goals into the future. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how the American Archive got started. Um, the Public Broadcasting Act was created in 1967, which created the Public Broad Corporation for Public Broadcasting, CPB, that's the corporate, that's the federal funding agency for us. It's, it's separate, though, from Congress. So Congress appropriates money to the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. They're an independent agency, which then grants out monies for public media um, entities, like radio and TV and programming. Um, and so the bulk of the funding, federal funding, that goes to PBS, NPR, and any of the independent producers or independent stations comes from CPB. So after 24 years of non-commercial television, there's still no archive of public television in the United States. In 1977, there was an internal PBS report which stated this. It is actually in the charter for CPB that they create an archive of all this material that the federal government has, or your tax dollars, have been helping to pay to create, um, but no archive had been created. Um, in 1979, WGBH established its archives as a formal archive with records management and actually taking, trying to take care of its historical materials. Um, in 1979, PBS operate, um, begins a public television library and broadcast archive. They basically kept a tape library of past programming. So as programming with, tapes were coming into them for final broadcast, they were actually beginning to keep them and store them. Um, but that wasn't their mandate. That really isn't PBS's mandate. Um, in 1993, PBS and the Library of Congress reached an agreement where PBS would be donating its broadcast tapes to the Library of Congress so that the Library of Congress could preserve these materials long term. Um, and then in 1997, the Library of Congress came out with a report on the state of TV and video preservation, and it was pretty dire in 1997. It's even more dire now because... Um, the material is even more deteriorating at this point, and there was not a lot of call to arms. Even though there were call to arms, there wasn't a lot of resources available in 1997 to actually move things along and preserve them, although it did raise the red flag. But we're a good, what, 20 years along now? <laughs> and we're just now starting to kind of like panic. This is like in panic mode right now. Um, uh, in 2004, WNET, WGBH, and PBS and NYU um, got money from the Library of Congress NDIP program to, to uh, do a pilot research project called Inter um, Preserving Digital Public Television. The goal was to see whether we could build a, reposi a digital repository to manage the uh, oncoming onslaught that everyone was foreseeing of digital files from public broadcasting and public media. Uh, we were quickly moving into the, the role of actually creating and producing materials on digital files as opposed to analog tapes, and the notion that we were going to have to start migrating the analog tapes to digital files for preservation. So they began to sort of think about how is this going to work? How can we all collaborate together and share in this repository? Um, and that project went pretty well. It was really just a research project, so it didn't end up becoming anything sustainable and solid afterwards. Uh, in 2007, uh, APTS pr proposed a digital repository uh, to be developed, and that was also sent to Congress. Um, noises were starting to be made that we needed to have some kind of a digital archive for public media. 
Uh, CPB in 2007 hosted a meeting with stakeholders to discuss the creation of the American Archive. Uh, what really, what basically happened was um, Congress had appropriated money for the digital transition for CPB, which CPB was um, helping to spend to give money to the stations for this digital transition. Uh, it didn't cost as much as they had anticipated it costing, so they had a pot of money left after the digital transition happened, and we had gone from analog to digital broad, uh, signal broadcasts. Um, so they uh, so they went to Congress and asked, can we use this money to start our archive? You know, we're mandated to have an archive of this material. We haven't done it yet. We haven't had the resources. Can we use this pot of money to really start figuring out how we're going to start archiving these this long cultural heritage and historic materials that all these public stations have created? So in 2007, uh, they did get support to use this money to um, to not only start digitizing the materials, but to create a plan on how they were going to preserve it. Um, 2008, CPB did a study. What was it going to take to create this archive, and what was it going to take to maintain and sustain it? In 2009, they did a pilot project, um, which they gave to Oregon Public Broadcasting to manage. And the idea was to just see, just to test it out. What would it take to digitize? How would that sort of be organized? Uh, is there content out there that's worthwhile? They focused on civil rights and um, civil rights, and I think it was World War II, like local materials on World War II. And they made a call out to stations to say, what have you got? We're willing to fund the digitization of a certain amount of material. We want to see what that process and workflow might look like. We want to see how much it's going to cost. We want to see what kinds of materials are out there. And I think that everybody that participated in it would say that it was a worthy, a worthy thing to do because it really started kind of waking us up thinking wow we have some great stuff in our archives there's some really amazing material here we really do need to do something um, I'm not sure that the materials that were created for that pilot actually it didn't actually go anywhere it just kind of sat there and I think everyone was sort of like well that was great but now what <laughs> Uh, so the next thing that uh, CPP did was they funded a content inventory project, which WGBH um, managed. And the idea for this was, okay, so we did this pilot. We kind of have some sense of what it's going to take to digitize. We have some sense of how much it's going to cost. We have some sense that there's really fabulous material out there, and these stations are passionate about keeping this material. But what's the next step? How much stuff really is out there, and how much do we really know about it? So a call was made out to stations to participate in the content inventory project. And the goal and, and money was, was granted out for people to actually do this work at the stations. I, I know Anne participated in it. Um, and the goal wasn't to take the tapes off the shelf and put them in the decks and play them and catalog them as, you know, a classic library catalog because that might have been the last time that tape was going to be played. And you didn't want to risk that just to find out what was on the tape. Not only that, but it would take forever. And it's really labor intensive to do that kind of work. So the goal was to just ask for a really quick inventory. What do you have? What, do you, what, what actual physical item do you have? What format is it on? What information do you have about it? Just type up what's on the label, what various things you might have in various databases. Really quick information. It it's not, was not deep cataloging. Um, and then after that, from that collection of inventories, we got 2.5 million records from over 120 stations that participated in the inventory, which was phenomenal. Nobody had any sense that there was that much material being kept out there. And that's a small sliver because there are over 300 stations that exist in the country. So people got really excited. Oh my gosh, there's all this material out there. We've got to do something. CPB then funded a digitization project where they gave out grants for for they actually didn't give out grants for digitization. They, had, they hired uh, Crawford Media in Atlanta to be the vendor, and people were sending tapes to Crawford Media in order for them to be digitized. And the goal was to digitize 40,000 hours across the stations that were participating. Out of the 120 that participated in the inventory project, about 100 participated in the digitization project. And the reason why some people didn't participate is there was risk in sending your materials to to a vendor, um, and there was time involved in pulling the materials together. I know everybody who, who took 
part in it was like, oh my God, how am I going to get all these materials out the door? You had to barcode them, you had to label them, you had to, you know, make sure you knew what you were sending, you had to get them back. So it was a lot of work on part of the stations, but I think in the end it was really worth it because now you have a digital file. You have a digital file of something that was on an analog tape, tape that you may not have even known you had. Um, the story we have at GBH is that we sent a lot of our quarter inch audio from radio out because we had no clue what was on the radio. You know, the radio, as you saw the quarter inch, they had really thin spines, so people didn't write a lot of information on the thin spines. We had one quarter inch audio tape that said Freedom Summer. That's it. Just said Freedom Summer. No idea what it was. When we got the digitized file back, we played it back, and it turned out to be Howard Zinn uh, recording voter registration during Freedom Summer which was amazing. And then we have all kinds of other stories during that, that voter registration period in the 60s, in 64, I believe, in the South, which is just incredible stories. Um, so that was, the, that's the, that was the benefit of digitizing. Um, we can now listen to it and fill out that catalog record much better, although that's very labor intensive, and that's um, something that we're working on at this end to, to try to figure out um, a better way that we can do that faster with not having to use so many resources. So that was the digitization project. Um, CPB ended up doing 40, 35,000 hours analog to digital. Uh, an additional 5,000 hours was, was con born digital, and that was when Casey came on board for the American Archive, and um, we were managing how we were going to figure out what, <laughs> what born digital files we were going to send, and, and the Library of Congress has been struggling to try to figure out how we're going to ingest these files. They went to Crawford, Crawford transcoded them. So we're still working on that 5,000 hours, but we're really, really close to making that, that finalized. Um, so the initial collection for the American Archive consists of 40,000 hours of digital material from over 100 stations. Uh, 5,000 of those hours are born digital. We still have the 2.5 million inventory records from 120 stations, and those are up on the website, and people can research those. They're not great records. Again, they're inventory records. They're not catalog, but they give you some sense of something, that there is an item out there and it has something on it. Um, in addition, there were over three million items that were identified that were kept at stations, archives, producers, university collections across the country. Um, these were some of the challenges we had with managing the Born Digital, and um, I, I think Rebecca also helped with us with that during her uh, NDSR residency program. She helped us with figuring out the file failure when we were moving the digital files uh, to, to Crawford and to the Library of Congress, um, which was great. Uh, so our current status right now is the library is close to 98% of having ingested all 40,000 hours uh, into their systems. We've launched the website for public access. Uh, the 2.5 million records are there, and we have the online reading room where we've made uh, the digital files of about 13,000 items accessible, and Casey's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the public can access all 40,000 hours of the digital files on location at GBH or at the Library of Congress. And the reason why there is that split is because of rights issues. We're trying as much as possible to push out what we can for public access, but even though the stations gave us the rights that they had, they might not necessarily have had all the rights that we feel comfortable with in terms of making it accessible to the public. So we're still working on what we can do there. Uh, we have launched a couple of new projects, um, the National Educational Television Collection Catalog Project. Uh, um, NET, National Educational Television, was the early precursor to PBS. It was a loose, not a loose, it was a more tight network of stations that were bicycling tapes to each other and producing and sharing materials uh, between them. It's precursor to PBS. Um, the materials uh, then were, I guess, um, inherited by WNET. Uh, when PBS came into existence. But basically what happens, these great titles are all over the place. There are about 8,000 to 10,000 titles that were produced. They exist at a couple of different repositories across the country. And our goal is to build a national catalog so everybody can figure out who's got what, where is the best copy. We shouldn't be digitizing all copies everywhere because resources are scarce. So we should be figuring out best copies and really sharing information that we have about these programs amongst us. So that's what that project is. And Sadie Rosa, Rusa, who will be here tomorrow, is working on that one. Uh, 
and the, the National Digital Stewardship Residency Program, which we're very excited about. Uh, we're expanding the original NDSR program for geographic diversity and focusing on audiovisual materials and public media because we really do uh, believe that you guys can help us push this initiative forward and really help the stations know the, the importance of this and then go out into the world and, and use your expertise and your knowledge that you've learned to just spread the word. Um, We've also got a project called Improving Access to Time-Based Media Through Crowdsourcing and Machine Learning. Uh, what we're basically doing with this program is taking all 40,000 hours of digital files, running it through a speech-to-text tool with pop-up archive. Uh, we know that speech-to-text tool um, is not 100% accurate, and it's sort of questionable how good those transcripts will be, but our goal, our thought is that at least we can pull out keywords from those transcripts. But we're building a crowdsourcing game for people to help us correct the transcripts. So NYP actually um, has done something fairly successful around this and we're we're kind of riffing off that a little bit and turning it into a game to make it a little bit more fun and hoping people can actually help us improve the transcripts to be a little bit um, better and there's also some machine learning going on with some audio files that um, we're building a database basically of, of sounds and voices. So for example, if um, one of the files has Richard Nixon speaking on it, it will um, map the sound wave of Richard Nixon's voice so that if it can match that with another sound wave that exists in the collection, it can tag that as having Richard Nixon also. So we'll see how that goes. That's gonna be a little bit of a research project on, on this, but hopefully it'll help us identify stuff using computers and not necessarily having to sit and listen to 40,000 hours to find Richard Nixon. Um, a couple of other projects that we have recently gotten funded is the PBS NewsHour. Uh, the CLEAR, the Council on Library and Resources, um, is funding the digitization of the entire um, NewsHour collection, which we're very excited about. And American Masters, they submitted their own project um, funding to um, digitize the interviews that have gone into all of the programming for American Masters. And they're contributing that to the American Archive. The Library of Congress will preserve the files. They'll be accessible at GBH and the Library of Congress. And they'll be streaming from the American Archive, uh, the American Masters website. So it's a little bit different kind of a partnership where they're going to retain um, the streaming and the access core, but we'll be linking to them. So people can discover the materials through us and then stream it from them. Um, we have an executive advisory council, which we're very proud of. Um, there's some key people here that are very excited about our initiative, and they've been giving us some great support. Um, and we're hoping to engage them a little bit more in the future. Um, they're all busy people, but um, we've noticed that Gwen Eiffel tweets about us quite a bit, which we're quite excited about. Uh, Newt Minow was very excited, and he actually uh, picked up the phone and called his friend at one of the foundations to kind of help fund us. Um, and uh, Yes, Courtney from LPB is on is on our um, on our board, and and we, it's just a really great group, and we're really hoping to engage them a little bit further as we move on. Our long term goals are to grow the collection. Um, we have four long term goals: growing the collection, helping public media organizations to archive, digitize, and make more of their collections accessible, increasing access and use, and building a consortium of local and regional institutions to better coordinate the preservation and access. So this is where this uh, NDSR program is really going to be helpful and geographically dispersing you guys and, and yet helping you to maintain as a cohort and connections and networks amongst yourselves. Um, in addition to growth in the long term, we plan to develop ways to work with public media organizations to further preserve and make accessible their content by helping them find opportunities within their own communities to fund these activities to uh, preservation and assist them with developing grant applications. This last round of NEH grants that just went in early July 19th, I think there were about five of them that had mentioned the American Archive in their grant proposals and that they were in contact with us and we were helping them sort of through the process and what, what they could say about us that would might um, uh, might levitate their proposal to a national platform kind of level. Um, uh, funding, um, we also want to be able to support projects that are connected that expose materials in the national platform. Um, the National Digital Stewardship Residency Program will be a great help to that. Um, and in the future, we plan to develop ways to license materials potentially as a revenue source, both for the local stations um, to help them maintain their own archives and continue to make the material more accessible. 
Um, finally, we realize that the long-term value of the institutions, we can't do it alone. We want to explore ways of developing consortiums of local and regional repositories to preserve the materials and make it accessible, and we want to establish a coalition of public media stakeholders in order to address the issues and, and the challenges. Um, we do have social media handles. We have, a, we have the website, of course. We have a Twitter handle, and we have Facebook. And um, everybody blogs <laughs> and Twitters <laughs> and posts on Facebook. So please help us spread the word by uh, doing that on your own social network and media. And that's it for us. Um, so thank you all for joining us and being part of this initiative. What makes uh, magnetic media challenging, especially challenging, as opposed to optical media, such as film, is that you don't know what's on a tape when you pick it up.